Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here to the 2015 uh, annual Anthony Jordan Lectures. This lecture series is dedicated to the memory of Archbishop Anthony Jordan, OMI, who was responsible for the founding of Newman Theological College uh, in 1969, when we began our mission uh, for theological education of seminarians, religious men and women, and the laity in the wake of a renewed ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council. The series is sponsored by the missionaries uh, Oblates of Mary Immaculate and Newman Theological College, and it offers the Edmonton community a unique opportunity to hear world-renowned scholars address topical subjects in theology. To the list of distinguished Jordan lectures, lecturers from previous years, we're honored to add this evening's speaker, Dr. Massimo Fagioli. Dr. Fagioli worked in the John XXIII Foundation for Religious Studies in Bologna between 1996 and 2008, and received his doctorate from the University of Turin in 2002. He moved to the United States in 2008, and received, um, uh, where he is now uh, assistant professor in the theology department at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. He lives in the Twin Cities with his wife and their children, um, and he writes regularly for Italian and American newspapers and journals on the church, religion, and politics. Dr. Fagioli is quickly becoming known as one of the most prolific and theologically informed Catholic scholars today. His writings have been published in many languages, as you can see on the, the table outside afterwards. Um, his most recent books include Vatican II, The Battle for Meaning, True Reform, Liturgy and Ecclesiology, in Sacrosanctum Concilium, John the Twenty-Third, The Medicine of Mercy, and recently Sorting Out Catholicism, A Brief History of the New Ecclesial Movements. His forthcoming book um, in, in English uh, is entitled Pope Francis and a World Church, dealing with some of the topics we'll hear about this weekend. And if this were not enough, he's currently researching a history of the Roman Curia and governance in the Catholic Church, and has recently uh, worked at establishing an institute for Catholicism and democracy at the University of St. Thomas. This evening, I am very pleased and honored to welcome him uh, amongst us to speak on the topic of Vatican II, Reflections 50 Years Later. Please join me in welcoming uh, Massimo Fagioli. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here. It's a great uh, pleasure and an honor, especially since I know that the speaker of last year was uh, Joseph Komonczak. Uh, and uh, every Catholic scholar in North America and in the English-speaking world uh, working on Vatican II and on church history, on, on ecclesiology, uh, tries to walk in, 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 in the footsteps of Joko Monchak, so it is a great responsibility. Um, and what I am trying to do tonight is to give some reflections on Vatican II 50 years later, focusing on uh, basically three points. The first point is uh, what we know about Vatican II um, as an event, as a moment of church history that we know now and that we didn't know 20 years ago or 30 years ago. The second point is what that knowledge that we have of the Second Vatican Council, uh, what that means for, the, for our understanding of the message of the Council theologically, um, as members of the church. And the third and final point will be some reflections on uh, the issue of the interpretation of the council that uh, in these last 10 years, more or less, uh, has been part of, of the debate in the Catholic Church on Vatican II. And in this moment in time, uh, especially after the, uh, the election of Pope Francis, uh, I think it is particularly uh, appropriate to 
look back at these last 10 years uh, because there's something that we now can understand better than, than uh, in the previous decade. So the first point is uh, Vatican II uh, in the big historical picture. So usually we tend to think that an event that is far from us uh, becomes more vague, uh, not as, as focused, as, 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 as distinct in our memory, in our understanding than it was before. Uh, that is not entirely true for the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and I will uh, give here three examples. So here we know of the Second Vatican Council more now than we knew uh, in 1965 when it uh, ended or in, in the 80s and, and in the 90s. Why? Because Catholic scholars, historians and theologians um, have worked hard <laughs> at trying to understand, to, to write the history um, of the whole event of uh, individual documents, of, of individual participants. That has been a massive work done by many, many scholars all over the world, not in one language uh, only, not in, in one cultural uh, element only. So of the three things that we know now that we didn't know back then with the same clarity, the first one is this, is that Vatican II is not the council that comes after Vatican I, which is, has been for a long time the automatic kind of, uh, of instinct. Also because, as you know, in the first half of the 20th century, uh, there had been a couple of serious attempts to reconvene Vatican I, under Pius XI and Pope Pius XII, uh, both failed. Uh, and for some, Vatican II is the same thing of those two attempts in the 1920s and in 1948-49. No, Vatican II is something fundamentally different, and if we want to understand Vatican II, we cannot compare it with Vatican I, which is exceptional in, in the history of the conciliar tradition, but the real uh, paragon, the real comparison is the Council of Trent. So if we want to understand the impact, the magnitude, uh, how it worked, the reception, Vatican II uh, is the second leg, if you want, of this journey of the Catholic Church into modernity. Uh, that is not something that um, is we, without consequences. There are a lot of consequences, for example, for how we understand the length of the reception. So, As you know, the Council of Trent in, in, in 1562-63 decided to create seminaries for, for the formation of priests, in the average diocese, we have the first seminary one century after, mid-17th century. So it's a, it takes a long time to implement things. Uh, something like that happens with, with Vatican II. Uh, there are many other consequences, but this is just one, one example. The second thing that we know much better now of the Second Vatican Council is that Vatican II uh, comes at the end of a very important and difficult period in church history that John O'Malley, in his very important book published in 2008, What Happened at Vatican II, called The Long 19th Century. And so Vatican II comes at the, at, the, at the end of a 19th century that is long, because basically lasts 150 years between the French Revolution and World War II, basically. So this is something that only a comparison uh, between church history and social, political history, world history, 
uh, as you know, long 19th century is an expression that was created by uh, the famous British he, he, historian Eric Hobsbawm. As 19th century is long, uh, is said, because it goes from the, uh, the French Revolution uh, until World War I, says. So only a comparative uh, interdisciplinary perspective can allow us to understand what is the position of the Second Vatican Council uh, in church history. This long 19th century is a period, basically, in which uh, the Catholic Church tries to understand what is the meaning of modernity, uh, of uh, cultural modernity, of political modernity, the culture of, of constitutions, of uh, rights, of democracy, uh, of pluralism. Uh, it's a very complicated period, uh, and all these tensions, it would be interesting, for example, if, if, if we had hours to compare the syllabus uh, of Pius IX, 1864, with, with some of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. I mean, there's, there's not just an evolution or a, a development, it says the opposite. I mean, Vatican II says the opposite on some things. For example, religious freedom. It's not something that you can say, well, they have developed an idea. No, no, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> So that is something that we can understand now only with that kind of historical uh, perspective. Um, that means also that we can, we can understand Vatican II not only in the context of a purely Catholic history or of a purely uh, history of Catholic theology, but, for example, one of the things that is now very clear, uh, if, if you read uh, the uh, diaries, the letters, the, uh, the lives of the bishops and theologians who made the Vatican II, is the impact of the two world wars. I mean, world War I, World War II, it, it, this big trauma. So this Christian world that is uh, engaged in this huge bloodbath uh, of, of Christians, uh, of Catholics. The Vatican II is the attempt to make, I mean, make sense of the, of the previous 50 years. All those bishops, uh, the Vatican II, they have lived through those years, all of them. Uh, in some cases, in the, in the trenches of World War I. So the, it's not something that we can say, well, that is a tiny part of their life. It's not. <laughs> it's a big part of their way of understanding the church, the world, uh, God's role in history. The third part is this, is that uh, the historical work at the Second Vatican Council uh, basically in the period between the uh, Synod of Bishops of 1985, when this work really begins, until the year 2000. So these are the most important 10, 15 years, between 88 and, and 2000, more or less, when the historical work uh, happens, are tiny parts of the history of the, of the, of the Second American Council that have a huge consequence for what we know and for the meaning of the council, they are, are chapters of the history of, the, of the, the council that before the 80s were largely unknown or known only to those bishops, theologians who were there and they were part of, um, of that, but that memory was uh, fading. One is the history of the preparation of the council. So when Pope John announces the council in January 1959, between 59 and 62, mostly 1960-1962, there's this work, uh, the preparation. So what is the procedure? What are the results of the preparation of the Second Vatican Council until the summer 
1962 was largely unknown before the volume of the history of the Second Vatican Council is published uh, in 1995, and that chapter by Joseph Komonczak, it's a chapter 150 pages long. <laughs> it's, it's not a chapter, basically. It's a book in the book. It's a history of those documents, those drafts, those ideas, and if you don't have those two years of, the of theological work to compare with what, with what Vatican II in the congregations did between 62 and 65, I think you miss the whole point. Another thing that happens in this uh, 15 years long history of the Council is a very detailed research at specific documents of the Council. Uh, we have books, studies uh, on, the, on the history of this particular document. And this work is still unfinished. So just to, to, to uh, give you a, an idea, uh, we do not have in any language né, a history of the Constitution on the Church. So that book doesn't exist. Nobody wrote that. We don't have a history of the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions, non Cetate. So we have several I mean, chapters. Several, but if you want to study and investigate what is moment zero of Lumen Gentium and the final draft, there's no such book. So we had uh, books on some documents, for example, on De Verbum, on Gadimus Pes, but not for all of them. But that is uh, a masterful way to see the history of ideas from the very beginning and in the prehistory of the Council uh, in the 19th century, early 20th century, what those ideas become at the Second Vatican Council. A third element that was discovered by historians and theologians working in these last few decades was the importance of the work done at Vatican II between sessions. As you know, Vatican II, all the bishops, they gather in Rome in the fall season, 62, 63, 64, 65, basically September, December, and then they go home. We assume that most of the work was done in Rome when they are in, in Rome. Actually, we now know that for some documents, the, the, the key changes, the crucial uh, debates in the commissions happen in the intercession. So the commissions, they keep meeting uh, two, three, four times during the, uh, the intercession, January, August. And in some cases, this is what uh, make the final document what it is. For example, Gadium et Spes. The final intercession, 65, January, August 65, is, is the crucial one to save that document, to have a document on the church in the modern world. And final element, uh, thanks to an interdisciplinary work, we know how many factors uh, had an impact on the history of the Council, uh, especially uh, certain political international issues that were, were typical of the early 60s. Um, and here not only uh, the most evident case is uh, religious freedom that was and a North American issue, especially for the bishops of, of, of the United States, but also a Eastern European bishops for uh, communism in Europe, but even more important for the document on non-Christian religions and on Judaism. So the role of Israel, of the state of Israel, uh, what the church should say about Israel. Should we say anything? Uh, that is a huge, huge factor uh, that uh, developed a few theological ideas 
in the Catholic Church that, for example, uh, in 1948 didn't know what to say theologically about the state of, of, of Israel. I mean, is the state of, of Israel theologically important, relevant for us? Does it say anything to us? In 1948, they don't know, we don't know. Uh, so Vatican II is one chapter in this development. So here we have the history uh, has uh, rediscovered uh, moments, meetings, voices, bishops, theologians that had been uh, almost forgotten. Why? Because Vatican II is a very complex event. Uh, it is, it begins in January 1959, it ends almost uh, seven years after the end of 65, 2,500 bishops, uh, hundreds of theologians. Uh, at, uh, Rome is, is, part, is, is the stage of this event, but with many non-Italian, non-European, non-Catholic actors. It, it's a very complex event. Um, and only an, an international team of scholars could rebuild that history, uh, all those names, all, all those uh, dates. Um, th that brings me to the second part. So what does this history tell us, tells us uh, on, the, on the message of the Council? So the first thing that we have to remember, I think, is that Vatican II uh, is documents, but it's documents in a context. So here, Vatican II, if it is used uh, only as a text, it is just like the Bible, it is very tempting to have a fundamentalist approach to those texts. You pick and choose the line that you want, that you like, that, that satisfies you, uh, your theology, your I mean, intent, but this is not how we should read the Bible. Uh, and if this comparison is appropriate, uh, this is not how we should read Vatican II. Uh, the Vatican II is deeply intertextual. So every issue is addressed not just in one document, but in at least two documents. But all these issues are, are in, intertextual. All that said, we have individual documents that uh, have really changed how we approach uh, the future of the church in the modern world. As you know, the final documents of the Council are 16 documents. Um, in my short list, there are seven documents that uh, are absolutely necessary. In my course on the Second Vatican Council, we read most of these seven documents. First, the document on the liturgy. Uh, that is the first document of the council approved by the, uh, the council. Is by the way, the only document that survives the period of the preparation. All the documents prepared between 1960 and 62, they are all rejected. All of them, except the the document on the liturgy. That says something. The second document is De Verbum, on the Bible. Uh, it had an incredible impact uh, that we now may take for granted. Um, my young students uh, tell me, of course, as a Catholic, you read the Bible. Well, of course, now. I mean, if you know church history, after the, the, the Council of Trent in, in Italy, you had Catholic bishops that, to make sure that Rome knew that they were not uh, soft on Protestants, they organized in the central squares of their cities uh, 
bonfires of Bibles. It was a very clear statement, there are no Protestants here. <laughs> so how much have we changed? A lot. So that largely because of the verbum, in, 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 in 1960-62, there are still theologians who claim an absolute inerrancy of the Bible, also scientifically. There are no errors in the Bible. 62. So uh, something has changed. Uh, the, uh, the Constitution on the Church. It is a beautiful synthesis of the whole history of ecclesiology. Of, uh, of the, of, uh, the patristic ecclesiology, the, the ecclesiology of Christendom, of the institution, which is still there, uh, of Bellarmine, of Trent, Bellarmine, um, of the Ressourcement, um, and of a modern attempt to develop ecclesiology. Uh, Gaudium et Spes, the final document of the Council, the last one, uh, it's, it's a very difficult document to use. It is very challenging, but it is the starting point, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, is the most important document for Pope Francis. I mean, when I look at Pope Francis speaking, in my mind, I see the balloon, like in, uh, in comics, is using that language. So it's impossible to understand Pope Francis without Vatican II, and especially without Gaudium Spes. Simply impossible. So that says something, that he, he never says that, or almost never says that, because he's a smart Jesuit. But it's clear <laughs> that there's the, the, the document on ecumenism, it's the end of this labeling of non-Catholics as either heretics or schismatics. It's a it's not a small achievement, I think. Uh, the Declaration on Religious Liberty. Uh, until 1964, the, the official teaching of the church says that uh, only Catholics can have religious freedom. Um, and non-Catholics, we, we can tolerate you. Uh, in the 1950s, if you were a Protestant, you couldn't you could end up in jail for being a Protestant in Italy. Uh, things have happened. So, a, 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 again, no, no small achievement. Um, and finally, my seventh uh, document is Nostra Etate, on non-Christian religions, which is the most important document, I think, to understand how Vatican II needs an implementation that goes beyond the strict letter of the text. So what John Paul II did in 1986 to call this interreligious meeting of non -Christ of Christian and non-Christian religious leaders in, in Assisi to pray for peace, it's nowhere in the document, it's nowhere in the debate of the Second Vatican Council, it is a magisterial act of, of interpretation. 1986, uh, it is three years before the fall of, uh, the, of the, the Berlin Wall, 15 years before 9-11, uh, where fundamentalism was not an issue. Or it was an issue just in, I mean, Iran probably, but it was not, not a big issue. So that was a prophetic act of a bishop who had been at Vatican II, interpreting Vatican II in, in a creative uh, way. So Nostra Tate, it is really part of, <clears throat> uh, it's an example of how Vatican II really um, works. So here, I, I think that the, the sum of it is that uh, the, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, after Vatican II, has renewed our theology because it made, uh, it made possible for us to see the tradition uh, in its whole context. And so Vatican II uh, doesn't 
abrogate the Council of Trent, for, for example, but it puts Trent in the whole tradition. That is the operation that Vatican II does. So a new understanding of the tradition. It is a council that gave us a church that it is spiritually more responsible of itself in the sense that it doesn't rely anymore on the support of political power to do what it does and to be what it is. And that is, again, something that lasted in various forms for 15 centuries. I mean, after Constantine, the fourth century, church and state, they were a happy couple, fundamentally, with, 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 with some quarrels um, and big incidents, like in France, I mean, the, the French Revolution, but that ha had undermined the, the credibility of the Catholic Church in, in, in the 20th century. And we are still paying the price for that. And so Vatican II, it's this, uh, this idea we can and we must be more responsible for us without I mean, relying on, on interested allies that do not share what we think is the core of our mission. Um, in, in, in the sense, Vatican II, and here I'm using the masterful uh, work of Charles Taylor, is, is a church that had understood that we need to be more authentic to be credible. And that is something that Paul the, the, the Sixth said uh, directly this, with these words almost. But if you look at Pope John and John Paul II, and, and Pope Benedict, so this idea that we need to be more authentic to be credible, uh, it is part of the effort of the Second Vatican Council. So here, I think that we know all that as a church, as a community of uh, scholars, of, uh, of, uh, of Catholic theologians, um, now 50 years later. So I, I, I think that uh, what I said is shared by the vast majority uh, or almost all the ones who have uh, said something, uh, published something on the Second Vatican Council. So why in these last 10 years in the, in the, in the, in the Catholic Church there, uh, there was this huge debate uh, on the proper interpretation of the Second Vatican Council, on the correct hermeneutics of the Second Vatican Council. Um, so some say that it is a symptom of the lack of a shared hermeneutic. And so, so they say that, uh, that Vatican II has created uh, a rift in, in the Catholic Church. It was supposed to be a council for a deeper unity of the church, but in the end, it, it created not just the small schism of uh, the Lefebvreites, but uh, two churches, basically. So the, uh, the, uh, the Vatican II liberal kind of uh, liberal progressive church and a more uh, the traditional Catholic church. Um, I think that this is uh, largely untrue or overstated. Uh, why? First of all, because those who say this, they have in mind the example of the church in the United States, which is really divided. That is fortunately not the whole picture. That is not the whole picture. Uh, in, in, I, I, I don't believe in, in, in the rhetoric of, of American uh, exceptionalism, but I have to say that there is an exceptional uh, way of the American Catholic Church of receiving Vatican II in these last 50 years. This is, it, it, it is something that is part of, of that, of that uh, 
uh, of that political culture, of the religious culture. All that said, in these last 10 years, something happened. So we shouldn't ignore that, especially after the speech given by Pope Benedict on December 2005 to the Roman Curia, uh, something happened. So if you recall, Pope Benedict, in, in, in the speech of December 22nd, 2005 to, to the Roman Curia, said there are two interpretations of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and one is good, and the interpretation of continuity and reform, and one is wrong, is incorrect, uh, is, the, is the, uh, the, uh, the hermeneutic uh, of discontinuity and rupture. So these two poles became part of the narrative of some Catholic journalists, some Catholic bloggers in, in, in the blogosphere to say, well, we have the right music and you have the wrong one. And as it happens always when things go into the blogosphere, uh, the nuances of that speech got completely lost. And so Pope Benedict said there the good interpretation is, is continuity and reform. And that second word, reform, which in theological language in, in church history is hugely important, got completely lost. And so what happened was that either you are for continuity and you're a good Catholic, or you are almost like a heretic. This is something that happened uh, largely beyond the intentions of Pope Benedict. Uh, Pope Benedict had a clear view of things, but he never dreamed of saying that Vatican II was completely for continuity and nothing changes with, with Vatican II. He never said that. So for the, the previous decade, and largely during the pontificate of Pope Benedict, uh, uh, people in my profession had to deal with that, had to face this kind of uh, hyper-simplistic rhetoric, which is exactly the opposite of uh, the complexity of uh, the event of, uh, the, of uh, the of the council, but here the problem is that the Second Vatican Council is not something that only intellectuals can understand. So, if you are a Catholic and you read the Bible, you are a Vatican II Catholic. Uh, if you believe that non-Catholics uh, are not going to help only because they're non-Catholic, you are a Vatican II Catholic. And so there's a long list of things. So here Vatican II works in a much simpler way than the way intellectuals have to use to I mean, understand things and to explain things. So what happened in these last few years is that the Second Vatican Council became victim of um, a heated rhetoric that assumed one thing that I, I think it is, uh, it is theologically very dangerous. And the idea was that Vatican II is a bunch of texts. It's a few hundred pages of documents. Um, and that's what you need. So you read those uh, and you will get automatically that there is a, only a continuous kind of interpretation that is the good one. Now, Vatican II is texts, but Vatican II is also an act. It's something that happened in the church and that still happens in the church. Uh, so here, Vatican II is not 
a printer of documents. It is a kind of a liturgical uh, event. It's just like saying, it's just like answering to the question, what is liturgy? Is, is to answer, is the missile. So you use the missile, but it's not the missile. It, it's something else that is an event, it's an act. This is what Vatican II, and that's why uh, every uh, session of the Second Vatican Council, every morning in St. Peter, opened with liturgy. Uh, it was meant to be a liturgical kind of act, and that should have consequences for how we interpret that. Because otherwise, we will reduce Vatican II as a printing machine of documents. So this is not what uh, an, an ecumenical council um, is. So this problem is not completely new. So I mean councils, so we started in the, in the, in the very first centuries, um, and the process of reception of the council uh, at some point meets always a critical point to use uh, a very beautiful sentence of Paul Ricoeur, he says, I quote, the text is like a child that without its father, the author, become adoptive child of a community of readers, end quote. So what's happening is that those fathers of the Second Vatican Council, so the, the conciliar fathers, the bishop were there, but also the fathers and mothers of, of, of our generation that had, have witnessed that moment, that, uh, that change, uh, is not going to be there forever. So it is our community of readers that need to adopt that text. And so this is why the theological and historical work at the Second Vatican Council um, is important, also because we tend to, I mean, forget how, how complicated the reception of a church event is. And here, once again, the example of uh, the Council of Trent is very important. So we tend to think that what shaped Catholicism after Trent are the documents of the Council of Trent. Well, that is only one part of the whole picture. So what shaped the Tridentine church are those documents, and what we know, we have called Tridentinism. So the first catechism, the first index of the prohibited books, the first uh, decisions of the, the Roman Curia, all these things. So we cannot say, well, trend, Tridentinism, it's a bunch of old stuff and it's it, it doesn't make sense to distinguish between who did what. And then being so selective with Vatican II. So, the, so in church history, every movement in the church uh, 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 doesn't work with one document becoming law one day after. It doesn't work this way. It has never worked this way. Um, so here, uh, I, I think we have, uh, as scholars who work at Vatican II, a deep responsibility, and especially as a church historian, as a historian of uh, theology, um, working in the United States, I, I see this huge responsibility because the more we look into the, the world of some narratives about Vatican II, mostly against Vatican II, it is very clear that the whole thing Vatican II uh, is almost unnecessary in that narrative. What counts is a certain view, narrative of the pre-Vatican II era, 
and a certain view of the post-Vatican II era. So, uh, if you think that in the in the 1950s everything was absolutely perfect, um, and and that you consider, for example, the uh, the example of the theologian who gave the Catholic Church religious liberty, John Curtin Murray, who in 1954 was silenced for saying that religious freedom is an individual right, and he was silenced, and he had to return all the books that he was reading on religious freedom to, uh, to the library. He could not just speak, teach, publish, not even read on that, 1954. So if you think that, uh, uh, that, that pre-Vatican II was absolutely perfect, well, then Vatican II, it's a problem for you. Uh, if you think that that perfect age of the 1940s, 50s uh, was destroyed by Vatican II and then you have 68 and the 70s, uh, you may think that, but don't tell me that this is what Vatican II produced. So uh, here there is an historical problem which means a problem for historians to understand what happens, especially to, uh, to understand why we have developed in some areas of, uh, the, of, the, of the, uh, the world, especially such a competitive views of history that are part of a political narrative much more than a theological narrative or much more than a spiritual culture, to say the least. So here, I, I think that what happened in the debate on Vatican II uh, is part of, of a normal uh, a process. On the other hand, I, I think that there are issues that must be solved considering that the, 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 the church now uh, is much more an open space so everybody who can log in uh, on the internet and open a blog can make splashes of all kinds uh, and in some areas they have uh, an audience okay so that is it's a theological problem but once again uh, i don't think that anybody who is I mean, critical of the Second Vatican Council would give up the idea that we can read the Bible, uh, that we uh, that we give religious freedom to non-Catholics, uh, that uh, it makes sense to celebrate liturgy in the vernacular. So, in this sense, I think that in 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 the long term, Vatican II uh, will be discovered also by those who now are skeptical or critical, because the church we live in is a Vatican II church. Uh, so if, if, if it's not possible, thank God, but if we had this chance to create a, a special lab and make an experiment in, in that laboratory to have a miniature of the Catholic Church and make the experiment of taking of that Catholicism, Vatican II, out, uh, like uh, uh, taking an organ out of a frog or something like that. Uh, I'm sure that nobody would like to stay in that kind of fictional church. Uh, so Vatican II is not a partisan thing. Uh, it was not supposed by those bishops, those fathers, to, to be partisan. Just look at the number of votes that all documents received. 98, 99 percent, 97, in some cases, percent. So it, it's not a partisan issue. Those documents are not partisan documents. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, the future of the Second Council, but also of the debate, on the council 
um, has a bright future because um, it is uh, the church that uh, we live in. Uh, and again, Pope Francis is uh, the embodiment of a post-Vatican II church. As you know, Pope Francis uh, became priest in 1969. In a sense, he has the same relationship with the pre-Vatican II church that I have and I was born in 1970. So that is one of the, of, of the, of the big changes with Pope Francis. Um, and I think we can appreciate those changes, um, especially considering the path of the Second Vatican Council in the church uh, in these last 50 years. Uh, I thank you for your patience and I'm looking forward to your questions. The most important element, I think, for a certain kind of, of, of polarization in the American Catholic Church is um, the fact that the American political system is a two-party system. It's, it's a very stable two-party system. Uh, uh, stable in this sense that they are the two same parties. So it's unstable for many reasons, as you can imagine. But so the, that has created, uh, for some issues especially, uh, a two party American Catholic Church. So you don't have that kind of perfect two party system. In, in any other country where the Catholic Church is so important like in North America, in the US. Um, so that is the first element. The, uh, the second element is this, is that in the social political memory of the United States, um, between the end of the 60s and the early 70s, uh, a certain idea of America breaks down. So there is uh, the civil rights movement, uh, Vietnam, uh, Nixon, and uh, the legalization of abortion in 1973. So a certain idea of America in the mid 70s and later is not working anymore as it was working. It's what in code is usually called the culture war. So at the end of the 70s, many Christians, they decide that something went very wrong in the previous decade and they have to fight back. The Second Vatican Council becomes part of that fight. And so, uh, some Christians, some Catholics, they see Vatican II as one, one factor that produced those, those uh, results. So this is, it's, it's still part of how uh, even the young generation looks at Vatican II, so they don't know Vatican II through its documents, um, so but they have received, in some way, the idea that Vatican II is like uh, is part of the same picture with uh, Woodstock, with uh, smoking drugs, all this, this, um, which is uh, it's it is it, it's funny, yes, but it is tragic. <laughs> so it's 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 just like saying the Council of Nicaea in the uh, in 325 uh, is part of I don't know of of the, of uh, of the, the political corruption of Constantinople. Well, okay, <laughs> but so a, a, a church history event. It's not 
enslaved to world history. I mean, there's a relationship, but... So this is uh, what I see in, as a European who moved to America six years ago. Uh, it was really shocking at the beginning to see how divisive uh, the Second American Council um, is in some quarters, in some, in some places. Uh, as a pope, he has an extraordinary biography. In a sense, very similar to Pope Francis. So there are many similarities. So he had seen a lot of world out of Italy. So he, he, he spent 30 years of his life out of Italy. And 20 of those years are in, in Bulgaria, 1925-34, and in Turkey, 35, 44. So it is you know, like another planet back then. So he understands that, uh, that there's something that Catholic theology uh, is doing already, but there's no magisterium for that. So, for example, uh, in Bulgaria, he actively discouraged young Orthodox who wanted to become Catholic because they were attracted by the institutional stability of the Catholic Church. He, he, he discouraged them. So, and he was not the only one. So he was, he, he was maybe the only papal diplomat doing that. But, but it was something... Um, I, I, so he understand that there's some delay that we have uh, developed and we need to, uh, to bridge that gap between reality and the magisterium. The major difference is that in 1924-25, when Pope Pius XI, and in 1948-49, when Pope Pius XII, they have the idea, they, uh, they make a test, and they, con uh, they create a secret commission of Roman theologians, uh, with some external members, but a very small commission. Um, and they run this idea in this commission. And in the end, it's something that doesn't take off. It stays there, so there are a few ideas developed, but uh, basically there is fear. So there's fear of an event that is too complicated, that we don't know where it might lead. And so Pope John, he makes a public announcement. And the day after, the Osservatore Romano, the official newspaper of, of, uh, the, of uh, the Holy See, reports the, uh, the, uh, the news in, in a small column in the internal pages. I mean, very small, because they didn't know what to make of that. Uh, so he announces that publicly, and then people will deal with that. So that's real leadership, by the way. So I decide, and then we'll see. So that it is politically very interesting. So he consults one person, his secretary of state, because secretary of state is, is the vice pope, I mean functionally, um, and nobody else. If he had consulted somebody, I'm afraid that I mean, obstacles would be built. Um, so he makes the uh, it's an Amazon, and in '59 he decides to create the agenda of the council by consulting every individual bishop in the world, telling them you can write you can write us a letter and tell us what you would like to talk about at the council. That is, um, but he spiritually, the most interesting th thing is that Pope John announces that knowing that he will not see the end of that. So he is not interested in having control on the final result. He, he I mean, he, he, he was elected to die soon, I mean, to be very blunt. Uh, well, um, of course. He, he, he knew that perfectly. So he launches that, uh, 
and uh, it's a long preparation. So between 59 and the fall of 62, nobody really knows if this thing is going to, uh, to produce something. It's only in November 62 when it, it, it's clear that this council is for real. So there's a real debate, there's a real um, uh, re reversal of expectations. But for three years, I mean, expectations are not that high. So that is the major difference. Uh, he makes that decision by himself a few weeks after he, his election. <clears throat> um, and he's a very skilled tactic. So, so one of the interesting things is that uh, he gives most of the organizational work for Vatican II to the Roman Curia, and that is a move that is, is a cause for desperation for some. Because, I mean, but it creates a mechanism, a system that will not give total control. So for example, the Holy Office doesn't have total control, which is for the first time in four centuries. So he's very careful, very uh, smart in organizing that, not antagonizing the Roman Curia. And he has to work with them uh, every day, but creating and, and introducing slowly new people uh, and new ideas. Uh, that is, it, it is masterful, uh, the caution that he used to open this event. Uh, so. so, there is a period after Vatican II that we could call iconoclasm. So, I mean, devotions, uh, it is part of every historical uh, bouncing back from a certain period. Uh, so that's something that I don't think any bishop today would I mean, subscribe. So there, have, there has been uh, an, ext an overzealous, let's say, uh, period. Uh, which I think is not part anymore of our interpretation. So how we, uh, we see Vatican II, in my experience, for example, uh, I, I've noticed that one of, of, of the ways for me to get my traditionally student attracted to Vatican II is to uh, let them see a short video when Pope John talks of, 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 of the rosary. Uh, he basically explains the, uh, the rosary with the same language that in the end will become Gaudium et Spes. I mean, it, it is, so, what I was surprised of, in part of Pope Benedict's speech, but mostly of the reception of that speech, is that already in 2005, that church was a church that, that, that was much judicious, much more judicious than the extremists of the 1970s. So that kind of speech, or, or that kind of um, two interpretations, one good, one bad, uh, it is something that to me uh, sounds very 1970s. So uh, that kind of of uh, pushback, of judicious pushback of, of, of Pope Benedict, I, I think it says more of his experience in the 1970s than of what the Catholic Church was in 2005. So in, in, in this sense, I, I think that there is a biographical element in Pope Benedict that played a certain role uh, in his in his statements on the Second Vatican Council. So, um, again, 
I am not impressed, let's say, with a priest, I mean, destroying the rosary, mm, but it's the same kind of thing that happens after Trent with bishops burning Bibles. It, it, it's the same kind of thing. So it's still the same church that has, I mean, sociological dynamics, and we learn from our mistakes also. So in this, I mean, Vatican II has no responsibility in, in this I mean, I mean, performance of uh, destroying the rosary, which, uh, so uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the leadership in the church should, I mean, take Vatican II for what it has done and to, uh, to explain it to the church of today. So not to those extremists or those zealots of 40 years ago. Uh, in, in this sense, I, I think that uh, Pope Francis' attitude is very wise because, not only because he's, he's a very traditional Catholic, I mean, devotions are a big thing for him, but that he, in my view, he is doing Vatican II without almost ever mentioning Vatican II, which is the best way to do it. Except in some key moments, so for example, the, the exhortation of November 2013, Evangelii Gaudium, it is entirely an act of appropriation of the Second Vatican Council. The key passage in Evangelii Gaudium is when he quotes at length the opening speech of Pope John of the Second Vatican Council, October 1962, when he says, uh, no serious Catholic theologian is entitled to nostalgia for the past. Not in these words, but basically he says that. Uh, it's time to go forth. So that document is a marvelous manifest of what Pope Francis makes of the Second Vatican Council. So here we are still dealing with a certain kind of trauma of, um, um, but again, I don't think, I, I think that those, I mean, acts, those extremisms, they, in the 1980s, they were gone already. I, I don't, um, I don't remember many instances of, uh, in the 70s, yeah, I, I was born in, in the 70s, so I couldn't say bad things on that decade. <laughs> but it is, it is a, a very particular environment. Very, uh, so, yeah. The first thing is this, is that the Second Vatican Council is very appealing because it's one moment when bishops and theologians work together which is not what happens every day today, let's say that. It is for many reasons, okay? So this is something that, as a theologian, I really try to work at. I mean, we cannot live in a church where theologians and bishops, they never meet on purpose. That is, is, uh, is uh, well, so that is, it's, it's a big problem. So. I think open dialogue is a good thing also because it is a dialogue on issues that the, the highest authority in, 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 the, in the Catholic Church, in, in this sense, the councils and papal statements, they haven't settled yet. So, in, 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 in the Catholic Church, there's no debate right now on the number of sacraments or on the professional faith. So these are settled. But there are other issues that are not settled. So they are new issues. And whether you are disturbed by open dialogue, when there are different ideas, they will find their way. And if they don't find the way of open dialogue, they find worse ways. That is, uh, is the reality. So there are 
new issues that I, I think are there, we cannot pretend that they don't exist. We shouldn't tell people that we are, are going to decide something that will please you anyway, but we should not think that the first job of the church is to uh, displease people. I mean, uh, there's a tension there. So here, Pope Francis, what he has done and is doing with the Synod, he has said very openly, I want a real debate here, and he's serious. So as you know, almost all the members of the Synod are elected, uh, and some are appointed by the Pope. When Pope Francis appointed his appointees for the Synod, 50% of them were, were bishop openly against him. Openly against him. And everybody knew that. So he's taking that seriously. I think that we are not accustomed to a culture of dialogue. We have lost that, and here there's one bigger problem, which is in the church of the 19th century, of the early 20th century, you have some people who have a voice in the church. Right now, right now uh, almost everybody has a voice. That is much more complicated. It is, uh, so, uh, a, again, in America, in the West, there are some priests, bloggers, who have much more authority and followers than any bishop. And don't, don't let me say what I think of them. <laughs> but it is a huge uh, new thing. Um, and I, I'm, I don't like measures like, I mean censoring or silencing people, but in my worst days with these priest bloggers, I am tempted to invoke the holy office of the 50s. I mean, they... <laughs> so that complicates the whole thing. That is... But again, I, I think the first step is to restore uh, a, a, an ethos of dialogue within the, uh, uh, the episcopate. Uh, the, uh, that's very important. So the, the synod of last October and of the next October on the family, they are real debates. In, in, in the synods of the previous 40 years, there was a script, basically. And just ask one bishop who has been there, what kind of experience was that? I mean, everybody, I mean, liberal conservatives, they all said it was a frustrating experience. So that, I think, it's a step forward. It's a very important step forward. I don't see Catholic. I don't see lay Catholics as small children. I mean, it is, so uh, again, one important thing is that these debates are not given to the public in small bits and pieces that are an ideological spin. So here, that's difficult. Okay, that's difficult. But I don't... So, in the Catholic Church, there is only one moment that is and has to be secret, the conclave. I like that. All the rest, I think, uh, there should be some kind of openness. For example, I'm, I'm against... Uh, for example, a live stream of the Synod or a live stream of a council. Because bishops have to have the, the, uh, the, uh, the freedom to say what they want to say we, we, without knowing that millions of Catholics are, are, are watching them. 
but I think that there should be information that is given. Uh, and, and this is what happened at the, at the Synod. So those speeches are private, are, are not public, but they can communicate. There is every day. So that started with, with Vatican II. So these press conferences every day, uh, the, the church is not a sect. So you can have a completely secret decision-making process if you're a sect. The Catholic Church is, 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 uh, is not sectarian by nature. Uh, how to do that in the age of social media, it's not easy. 